Kingdom Hearts Rechain of Memories, everyone's 5th to 7th favorite game in the series. And to be honest, that's not really an indictment on Recom because it's got a lot of stiff competition. But for what it's worth, I quite like this card-based romp through Castle Oblivion. In fact, I made a whole video essay talking about why I think it's one of the most underrated entries in the franchise. I did discuss the actual gameplay in that video, but my main focus was on the story and characters. Today I want to try and balance the scales a bit. Specifically, I want to talk about a somewhat overlooked portion of the Chain of Memories combat system, that being the enemy cards. In that way, this will serve as something of a sequel to my enemy compendiums for Cage 1 and 2, but this one will be a little different. Because in place of the usual pastime of hunting Heartless for synthesis materials or rare weapons, Perfectionists and Trophy Hunters will be spending a lot of time in Castle Oblivion searching for each enemy's respective enemy card. And for many folks, the enemy card is just that, a collectible to be filed away in James Cricket's journal to fulfill a requirement that, for whatever reason, releases dopamine in our brains. It's kind of like how I saw Pokemon cards as a kid. I didn't play the actual game, I didn't even try to learn as a matter of fact. I just liked the artwork and trying to have at least one of everything, and then just looking at all of them all lined up in my binder. Likewise, the enemy cards in Com are far from necessary for completing the game, and I'd wager that for many of us, especially those who first played the game as kids, we focused on stacking our decks with 8s and 9s and just combo mashing our way to victory, never paying much mind to building decks for slights or around enemy cards. Because, quite frankly, it works fine, and again, it's just like power leveling your starter Pokémon and filling out their moveset with 4 attack moves. But today, we'll really be sampling the finer, more artful side of the Recom combat, swirling around our wine glasses and very carefully decanting it, really allowing for some aeration and noting the austerity, that sort of silky aftertaste. Of, ooh, I'm getting a, getting a hint of Yu-Gi-Oh with this one, I think. I literally googled snobby wine terminology for this bit. Since enemy cards often have passive effects that disappear after a certain number of reloads or attacks, some players may brush them aside as an inefficient use of valuable card points, which could go toward adding some zero cards or a couple of cures. And like I said, they very well may be right, but it's pretty fun to experiment with these enemy cards, and it can pave the way for some new strategies, at least until you unlock Sonic Blade or Lethal Frame and bring this game to its knees. So, the goal here is to go through every enemy card in the game, from basic grunt enemies to the bosses to some additional special cards. I'll show off each one's effects and give my own opinion on how much utility I think it can have in a typical playthrough of the game. Bear in mind, I haven't tested every enemy card in every conceivable situation, so I might miss something, which is why I'd love to hear about any strategies you have in the comments. I came across a handful of pretty useful and amusing setups while researching for this video. But before we get into the actual individual cards, I want to go over some more general information regarding how the cards work and the best way to acquire them. First off, as taught to you by totally not the final boss of the game for whatever reason, enemy cards exist as a secondary type of card separate from attacks, magic spells, and items. So if you toss an enemy card into your deck, you're not going to see it among your more conventional cards until you hit the select button. At least that's what it is on PS4, the big boy middle button. I don't know what it is on this thing, I assume you bop it or twist it or pull it or something. While enemy cards aren't valued 0 to 9 like your other cards, they do still cost a set amount of card points, which I'll note on screen. And as I mentioned, these enemy cards often have passive effects or buffs that'll wear off after you reload a certain number of times, use enough attack cards or slights, or take enough hits. Typically, stronger or more useful cards will have stricter limits and cost more card points, though there are some exceptions. Also remember that enemy card effects do not stack. You can carry as many cards as you can manage into a battle, but you can only benefit from one enemy card buff at a time, and using another while you have one active will just replace the current effect. Next, we should cover how you actually go about getting these enemy cards, and there's essentially three different ways they're acquired. The simplest are boss cards, which are automatically obtained when you defeat a boss for the final time. I say final because some bosses, like Axel or Riku Replica, are fought more than once and unlock different cards like Fire or Mega Potion after their earlier battles. This method applies to both Sora and Riku's story, and we'll talk about differences in Riku's campaign a little later. Another way to get enemy cards, including ones depicting organization members who first appear in Cage 2, is through Key to Rewards or Bounty Rooms. These cards all come at the end of the list, so I'll go into more depth on that when we get there. But finally, the most common method of collecting cards is by defeating enemies in regular, non-scripted battles, though it's unfortunately not as straightforward as collecting synth materials in the numbered titles. Naturally, you're not guaranteed to pick up an enemy's card the very first time you defeat it, because it's all up to chance. There's a chance that the usual map card you'd get as a prize for winning an encounter will be replaced by an enemy card. What's crucial to know is that you only have a chance of getting a card that corresponds with the last enemy you kill in an encounter. So if you're trying to get, say, a Red Nocturne card and there's a bunch of those guys floating alongside some blue Rhapsodies, you want to take out the blue guys first to ensure that the last thing you kill is a Red Nocturne. As such, most enemy cards are only available in certain worlds, which will be noted on screen, just like in the other compendiums. 
While praying for RNG can definitely be annoying, especially if you're just trying to get that battle card collector trophy so you can move on with your life, there are some ways to mitigate the pain. Certain map cards, specifically Teeming Darkness, Looming Darkness, and Almighty Darkness, increase the likelihood that battles will end with an enemy card in your pocket. The trade-off here is that these rooms are all slightly more dangerous in some way than other rooms. Teeming Darkness features an overall larger quantity of enemies in the field, Looming Darkness has enemies that'll pursue you very aggressively, and Almighty Darkness gives a plus two card value buff to every enemy's attacks. So if you're really trying to hunt down a specific card, I wouldn't even waste your time unless you're using one of these three rooms, though there are a couple of exceptions. I'd personally recommend using Teeming Darkness, since the actual battles aren't any harder, and you aren't being bombarded in the field, and you overall have more chances thanks to how big and populated the room is. Due to the random nature of how map cards themselves are acquired, I would also recommend making sure you always have at least one roulette room card on hand. Encounters in this room give you a pretty good chance of spinning a wheel that you can easily rig for yourself to get whatever card you want. So you can essentially use this to farm as many Teeming Darkness cards as you want, just make sure to land the wheel on another Roulette Room card before you're done. That all being said, I actually learned halfway through writing this script that you can literally bypass all of that and pretty consistently manipulate the RNG to get enemies to drop their cards at will. I could go into more detail, but I'd basically just be repainting an already existing video, so I'll just link to it. Basically, if you're not interested in doing things the way Tetsuya Nomura intended, you can use the strategy outlined here to dodge rule your way to easy enemy cards. But I also figured I'd give you the easiest way to do it without breaking the game. Lastly, I should note that Sora and Riku's campaigns differ in how they handle a lot of the combat stuff, and this includes enemy cards. Riku has no chance of getting enemy cards from regular mob fights and only earns cards through boss battles. He does, however, have a specific basic enemy card in his deck for each world, for example, a Fat Bandit card that's only available while he's in Agrabah and nowhere else. So I'll make sure to note those occasions on screen as well. A cool trade-off for Riku, though, is that he gets to keep every enemy card he earns in his deck at all times. Since you can't edit his deck, and there's no card points to worry about, he'll always have access to every boss card that he's collected, which is pretty cool. I think I've covered all of the expository stuff, so now we can move on to our first card, which is... The Shadow, as basic and common as ever. Due to both their natural frequency and the addition of the Bottomless Darkness card in Recom, you can find these guys in any world besides the 100 Acre Wood, of course. Thanks to that Bottomless Darkness card, you can force each encounter in those rooms to be all shadows, which guarantees it'll be the last enemy you kill in a battle, though this is in exchange for the heightened drop chance you have in the Teeming, Looming, and Almighty rooms. The Shadow card's effect is Incrementer, which increases the value of all your cards by one. For the price and the ease of acquiring this card, it's not too bad, especially in the early game when you're stuck with a bunch of low-value cards and a limited amount of card points. For the sake of comparison, 25 CP is 7 points more expensive than one Kingdom Key card valued at 9 to give you an idea of the exchange rate. One pretty major drawback, though, is that this card essentially invalidates any zero cards in your deck for two reloads, as these will be increased to useless one cards. Next is the Soldier, which appears in Traverse Town, Wonderland, and Twilight Town. I should note, unless you're concerned with leveling up quicker, going to the earliest available world to farm enemy cards is generally your best bet, just by virtue of the enemies having lower HP. The bar at the top here displays the worlds in their conventional KH1 order, but bear in mind that you could go to Halloween Town before Wonderland or Olympus, so the lower the floor number, the weaker the enemies. The Soldier card comes with the Combo Plus effect, and this works pretty much the exact same way it does in your more conventional KH games. For three reloads, your basic attack card combo will have four swings instead of three, with the final one being the more powerful finisher. Note that the card that gets doubled is the third one, i.e. the fourth strike and the finisher will be the third card in the combo. It's 10 points cheaper than the Shadow card, probably because it doesn't have quite as much utility. You can get a bit more mileage out of your stronger attack cards, but given that these effects don't stack and all the other options you'll have, this one might get lost in the shuffle. Here we have the Power Wild, which has been relegated to Olympus Coliseum after losing its home to Edgar Rice. The Power Wild's ability is Retrograde, which reverses the value of each card, so 1s become 9s, 9s become 1s, 2s become 8s, 8s become 2s, etc. Zeros, for the record, are not affected. Initially, I thought this was a bad card, and it would be if you slapped it onto the deck of high-value cards you've been building up. But if you purposefully make a deck of 1s, 2s, and 3s, this card gives you a deck of 9s, 8s, and 7s. It only lasts one reload, which sounds underwhelming, but you can avoid reloading a lot longer when you have so many low-value cards. You bypass the card point requirement and still get the benefit of high-valued cards. So for early-game mob fights and even boss battles, you can't go wrong with this, especially since your zero cards are left unchanged. Next is the much less useful Simeon card, the Bouncy Wild. This card has the cheapest cost at 10 CP and the highest reload threshold at 5, which should foreshadow how relatively useless it is. Bouncy Wild applies the ability Draw, or Treasure Magnet, for KH1 stands like myself. 
It does the exact same thing it does in the other games, causing experience orbs and friend cards to gravitate towards you. Which is nice and all, but when you can only use one enemy card at a time, this is pretty easily overshadowed by almost every other card in the game. The XP orbs and friend cards are easy enough to collect without a magnetic buff, so this damn dirty ape isn't even really worth the 10 card point price of entry. The large body card costs 40 CP, which is actually the most expensive the regular enemy cards can get, and applies the guard effect. Given that you can't actually guard using your Keyblade in this game, this is the next best thing. In this case, you channel the impervious big belly of the large body and invalidate any frontal physical attacks against you. Just like the large body, however, you're not protected from frontal magic attacks or physical attacks from behind. Since you can get this card pretty early, it might be worthwhile to use here and there if you don't have many other options. Next is the Fat Bandit, which sort of applies a reverse of the large body's guard effect, but onto other enemies. The Fat Bandit's effect, Back Attack, comes at 40 CP and causes you to deal more damage when striking enemies from behind, much like how Fat Bandits can only be physically damaged through Back Attacks. This isn't too bad, but it's kind of a worse version of a card you'll get later, and this one requires you to hit the enemy from a specific angle. But it's still not a terrible deal, you get two reloads of increased damage if you manage to stab your enemies in the back consistently. I really think we've got one of the worst cards in the game on our hands here with the C Neon card, which somehow has the audacity to charge 20 card points per use. I don't know why we're hopping over to Atlantica by the way, but that's how the journal is organized and I hate it. The C Neon's ability is Random Values, which does pretty much exactly what you think. The values on your cards shuffle at light speed and you'll have no idea what number you're using until you play it. I struggle to think of a scenario where this could be useful. I would give it credit for being like, the closest thing you can get to a built-in recom randomizer, but you can't even and get it until Atlantica, which is in the second batch of worlds. Even still, the random values effect only lasts for one reload, so it's really not even good for that. Just put it in your binder and turn the page. Back in Agrabah, because we couldn't just group these things together, we've got the Bandit, which comes with the combo finish effect at 30 CP. This is kind of a weird one, it basically makes it so every Keyblade attack has the power and animation of a finisher move. So essentially it makes your typical 3-hit combo impossible, instead letting you skip right to the strongest blow. I never used it much myself, but I guess in a boss battle, if you've got lower cards, you're at least turning all of your attacks into stronger finishers, and if one gets broken, you can just try again with the very next card. This finisher effect applies to both grounded and aerial combos. The latter seems to come out faster like it did in the first game, though it's harder to land on grounded enemies, so keep that in mind too. Here we've got the pirate with the ability All Zeros, which is what the cool kids in high school called my lunch table. Sort of like the Power Wild, at first glance I thought this card was kind of garbage, but it definitely can have some utility, especially if you feel like being a cheesy bastard. It only costs 30 CP to equip it, and it transforms all of your cards into zeros, and zeros normally cost quite a bit to equip. Obviously, as a blanket strategy, having a deck full of zeros is a pretty bad idea, since even though they can break any card, they can be broken by any other card if you play yours first. So, in a mob fight, this is a terrible idea. But bosses in this game have to play by the same rules you do. That is, if they use slights, they have to sacrifice the first card in the trio to pull it off. Meaning, unless they have a special item card, the first card in their slight is gone for the rest of the battle. So if you really feel like playing the long con, this is like the closest thing there is to timing out your opponent in Recom. With the deck of all zeros here, we can just evade our enemy, in this case Captain Hook, and only play cards to either defend ourselves from an attack or break his slights. Slowly but surely, he runs out of cards and won't even be able to put certain slights together anymore. Bear in mind this only really works on bosses who use slights, since other bosses won't lose their cards no matter how much you break them. So if you're really desperate for ideas and want to play ultra defensively, then all zeros is one route you can take. Next we have the Red Nocturne. We're gonna fly through a lot of these here for the record, since I'm mostly talking about the card's effects, and a lot of them are fairly straightforward. I've also had to like, physically describe and roast some of these guys twice now, so... The Prismatic Melodies in this game all give you a boost to their corresponding elements for 20 CP. The Red Nocturne grants Fire Boost, which increases the strength of all fire-based abilities. This includes basic fire spells and their higher tiers, as well as slights with the fire attribute like Fire Raid, Mega Flare, Faraga Burst, and Raging Storm. As far as I can tell, this doesn't apply to Keyblade cards with elemental effects, like Lionheart in this case, but I never really use those because I don't want to risk accidentally healing an enemy that absorbs fire. But if you've got a deck built around using fire moves a lot, you can't go wrong with this for some extra juice for one reload. I personally made use of the Nocturne card when grinding to level 99 for Sora, so my Mega Flares would do a bit more damage. Fittingly, the Blue Rhapsody is next, with exactly what you'd expect. Blizzard Boost powers up your Blizzard Spells, Blizzard Raid, Homing Blizzara, Aqua Splash, and Freeze. 
So just like with Red Nocturne, this is great for Blizzard-centric decks and probably more useful for early game screen clearing since you start off with Blizzard cards and most of these attacks have a wide spread, especially Blazaga. I should also note that you can totally use more than one of each common enemy card in your deck if you don't mind using the extra card points. So if you can't get through a typical encounter with only one reload and you have a spare blue Rhapsody, you can toss it into your deck for another reload worth of Blizzard buffs. Next is the Yellow Opera, granting Thunder Boost. This will apply to Thunder Spells, Thunder Raid, and I'm pretty sure that's it. So pound for pound, I'd have to recommend going with either of the previous two Prismel cards over this one, especially since you don't even get Thunder until like halfway through the game. The last Prismatic Melody in the game, the Green Requiem, unsurprisingly increases the potency of your Cure Spells. It doesn't seem to apply to the Gifted Miracle Slate, which cures you a bit and resets your reload counter, but also heals your enemies, so I never really bothered with it. Despite seemingly having less utility than its siblings, the Green Requiem card can serve as a good substitute for having another Cure card of a high enough value to avoid being broken, especially since one Green Requiem card is still 5 CP cheaper than a Cure card with a value of 1, so not a bad option. Next up is the Wizard, which fittingly provides the Magic Boost ability for 30 CP. This is the first card that actually keeps you from using certain cards. It powers up your Magic cards in exchange for being unable to use Summon cards. For me, this is a pretty good trade-off, mostly because single card summon attacks are pretty easily broken unless they're like 7 to 9 cards, and the slights usually take too long and I'm impatient. So if you've got a magic-based deck that's dedicated to clearing out mobs, popping the wizard card before you get to screen wiping could prove useful as long as you don't care about using summons. If not, there's an inverse option of this card which we'll get to soon. Up next is the Air Soldier with an ability called Reload Kinesis. For 30 CP, this lets you reload while moving, whereas normally Sora has to plant his feet and wish and wish with all his heart. This definitely has some uses, especially if you often find yourself ending up with a 3 on your reload counter, which pretty much leaves you a sitting duck or forces you to stop and start for a long time to safely reload. I could see it especially coming in handy during boss battles, which might leave you stuck with a high counter. Bear in mind this effect only works while running and not while you're mid-air while jumping or gliding. Up next is the Barrel Spider with the Quick Load ability at 30 CP. It's one of the least common regular enemy cards in the game since Barrel Spiders are generally uncommon spawns. You can only find them by hitting barrels in the field, some of which drop prizes or cards, and some of which initiate an encounter. Luckily, these fights only have Barrel Spiders and can be found in those three aforementioned rooms that increase the drop rate. The Quick Load effect is pretty middling, however. The description says it reloads your cards instantly, which it does, but it also doesn't. When I first got my hands on one, I assumed it meant you could bypass having to hold and charge the reload card, whether it was a 3 or a 1. But you still have to fill up the counter, a quick load just skips the whole shuffling animation that the cards have to cycle through before they're usable. So they're definitely loading quicker, but maybe not as quick as you'd initially think. And with so many other cards available, there's probably something more worth your time and points unless you've got a deck with a ton of cards. This next one is pretty goofy and not in the spinny, yucky, get killed by a rocky way. It's the White Knight, which... Oh no, you can't just- you can't just be saying slurs in the video game. The White Knight applies, and I'm not religious, but I feel like I should do the sign of the cross here before I say this. The White Knight applies float to your character, which makes him floaty. As far as I'm concerned, this is a gimmick card. There are never really occasions where you desperately need to jump higher to hit something. There are enemies that fly around but never really go so far out of reach that you can't reach them with normal combos if they don't just meander down to ground level on their own. Okay, actually, there's one situation where I think it could be pretty useful. The second Marluxia battle has these sections where the main body is really difficult to hit, and you can bypass these parts with float and just jump up there. And it's actually really useful and satisfying, so maybe consider it here. You won't be using it during the third battle, and you can't edit your deck between fights, but it only costs 15 CP, so it's not too bad. Next up is the Air Pirate, which gives you Item Bracer for 3 reloads in exchange for 30 CP. This makes it so your item cards can't be broken. So if your deck really calls for the use of an item to get as much mileage out of your setup as possible, then this isn't a bad idea to have on hand. I know the first Elixir and Mega Elixir cards you get are pretty low value, so this is a good way to make use of those without having to go hunting for higher value replacements. It also lasts 3 reloads, which is pretty generous, so not a terrible card to bring along. Next is the Gargoyle, which comes with the Vanish ability, referencing the Gargoyle's own ability to become intangible. For 15 CP, you can equip this card and play it for, like, a chance of not getting hit every now and then. It turns Sora transparent, and he'll, like, fade in and out, and I guess enemies target you less frequently, and sometimes you'll get lucky and invalidate their attacks, but sometimes you're at, like, max transparency and still get hit, so I really don't think this is worth your while. 
Here we've got the Search Ghost, which comes with the Drain ability for 35 CP. This one's pretty good, it restores a bit of HP with each successful attack you land, which is referential of the Search Ghost's own ability to do that against Sora in both this game and the last. Its limit is reload based and not attack based, so you can potentially have dozens of cards that simultaneously damage enemies and heal yourself before having to reload once. Again, a Cure card with a value of 5 costs 31 CP, and this is only 4 points more for a passive card that essentially gives healing properties to your attack cards. It's especially useful when it appears on the Monstro floor of Riku's story, as the only way he can heal in battle is by finding Michael cards, and who would have guessed he doesn't always reliably show up when you need him to. The only downside is that enemies drop fewer experience points when this is in play, but even then it doesn't completely eliminate the gaining of experience. Still, it's good to have on hand for an emergency. Next up is by far the most useful of the Atlantica Grunts, the Aqua Tank, which comes with the Auto Reload ability for 30 CP. It does exactly what it says on the can. Whenever you run out of cards, they'll automatically reload without needing to press a button. But despite being the best card under the sea, I can't really strongly recommend this either. Unless you're frequently getting down to having 3 on your reload card, I don't know if 30 CP is a worthwhile investment. Maybe during the latter parts of lengthy boss battles where you want to skip the reload weight, but that's all I can really think of. It's especially less useful if you take advantage of item cards, since Aqua Tank counts that as a reload. It does typically cost less, with a high potion valued at 9 costing 72 CP, and the Aqua Tank reloads all types of cards, but items are also way easier to come by and don't require you to activate the enemy card ahead of time. Next is the Screw Diver with the inverse of the Shadow ability, Decrementer. Just as the Shadow raises the value of all your cards by 1, the Screw Diver lowers the value of every card by 1. So it's at least more reliable than the Chaos of the Sea Neon card, but there aren't a ton of scenarios where debuffing your card values is going to come in handy, and it seems like the game knows that since this costs 10 points less than the Shadow. I guess hypothetically you could use this to make your card values lower to pull off slights like Ars or Ragnarok, but you could probably just put low value cards in your deck in the first place since they cost less and are easier to come by. And even still, it's not like this card prevents those moves from being broken, so I'm not entirely sure what the strat is here. Here we've got the Wyvern, which comes with the Reload Lock ability for 20 CP. This keeps your reload counter from counting reloads for a total of 3 reloads. If you really wanted to make use of this card, I'd recommend using it at the start of a long boss fight, but there's probably a handful of other cards that I'd suggest using before this one. Next is the Defender, which is mercifully simple with the Protect ability. As the name implies, this card will decrease the damage you take from physical attacks for one reload at the cost of 30 CP. Bear in mind it does nothing to protect you from magic-based attacks, there is a card for that later. Hard to complain too much about this one, if you're really getting pummeled in like a Riku replica fight, this could come in handy to stop the bleeding. This next one is kinda weird, it's the Dark Ball, which actually can't be obtained in Sora's story, at least not in Recom. In the original Game Boy Advance version, the Dark Ball's ability was called Card Blind, with the description, Hide the cards you hold from hostile eyes. This card still wasn't even useful during Sora's campaign, and only had use within Calm's Link mode, which was the multiplayer mode that you probably forgot existed. But the mode allowed you to do battle with another player using decks you built in the main story. Just like in boss fights, you can see the card that your opponent is shuffling through, so the Dark Ball card would make your cards invisible for 3 reloads. Since Link mode wasn't carried over to Recom, the card functionally has no use, so they straight up didn't put it in Sora's story. Which I've always kind of hated, surely they could have come up with something else. But yeah, don't go hunting for it because it's not here. It does show up in Riku's story, but only in Atlantica. Over here, the card has the Dual Trigger ability, which causes every card you play against an enemy's card to trigger a duel. This is really good for quickly getting the Duel Master trophy, which requires you to win 100 duels, so at least there's that. Just get used to Under the Sea and an adventure in Atlantica. Up next is the White Mushroom, the only friendly enemy in the game. Its ability is Hyper Healing, formerly known as Second Wind in KH1. Its function here is a bit different, since usually Hyper Healing helps party members revive more quickly after being knocked out. In Recom, Hyper Healing refills a decent chunk of your HP every time you use a friend card. This costs 40 CP, and you're probably likely to get at least one or two friend cards per encounter, and a guaranteed one inside meeting ground rooms, though I don't know if it's worth relying on since you can't control when friend cards drop beyond that. Like the Shadow, you can make White Mushroom spawn in any world by using the White Room map card, so you can get it as early as Traverse Town. On the other side of the coin is the Black Fungus, which is also attainable in any world through the Black Room map card. For 40 CP, the Black Fungus grants the Random Flush effect, which is one of the more gimmicky cards in the game, though still infinitely better than the other Random Enemy card. Random Flush activates a Random Enemy card effect, including boss and organization cards, so again, obviously not reliable, but fun to mess around with. 
The first of the new Chain of Memories enemies is the Creeper Plant, which grants the fan-favorite Leaf Bracer ability for 35 CP. Just like in the main games, Leaf Bracer keeps your cure spells from being interrupted, even if the enemy has a higher card than you. Can't really go wrong with this one, especially if your cure cards are lower values. You can also get this as early as Wonderland, so it might be worth grinding for if you hate having your heals broken as much as I do. The next calm newcomer is the Tornado Step, which gives you Reload Haste for 30 CP. It's another one of those cards that alters your reload counter, this time subtracting 2 from the counter when it's used. I can't really recommend it any more or less than something like the Wyvern card, it's again only really worth it if you find yourself ending up with a high reload counter fairly often. And the last of the calm newbies is the Crescendo, which is the reverse of the wizard card that I mentioned earlier. The Crescendo grants Summon Boost, referencing its ability to summon more enemies. As you may have guessed, this card blocks off your use of magic cards in exchange for stronger summon cards. So if you prefer to wipe out mobs using Simba or Cloud or Dumbo, you can throw this on to beef them up. Keep in mind that your magic is only locked out for one reload, so you can hypothetically bring both the wizard and Crescendo and use one round of magic and another round of summons. The final regular enemy card is also one of the best, the Neo Shadow, which for 30 CP grants you the ability Bio. Just like its origin as a black magic spell in the Final Fantasy series, Bio functions as a poison attack, slowly draining your opponent's life away. When this card is in play, every enemy around you will gradually lose life until your next reload. It can't actually kill an enemy, but it can drain their life all the way down to 1 HP. Since Neo Shadows first appear on the 13th floor, there is limited utility to the card, since you'll likely have other and faster ways of dealing with mobs by this point. But surprisingly, the card even works on bosses, so if you really wanted to, you could stall out Axel or any of the Marluxia fights until they're one hit away from death. Getting into the boss cards now, the first of which is Guard Armor, fought at the end of Traverse Town. For 30 CP, the card grants the Wide Attack effect, which slightly extends the range of attack cards. And, uh, it sure does. It's never really make or break with this card, but since you're guaranteed to get it by the end of the first world, it might be worth equipping if you have excess card points and not a ton of cards to use. By the way, the boss cards are sort of unique in that they often aren't centered around reloads as their limit, instead of focusing on the number of attacks you dish out or receive. In this case, wide attack lasts not for a certain number of reloads, but 30 total attack cards, which will probably extend past one reload in the early game. Here we've got Hades, fought at the end of Olympus Coliseum. I'm sorry, can I take a moment to just- I, I fucking hate how these cards are organized. This kills me. Why would you put the monkeys in the middle of the soldier and the large body? Why would you throw the sea neon in the middle of the Agrippa guys? And then the pirate, and then the prismels, and then fuck it, random hollow bastion wizard, and let's not keep the Halloween Town heartless together, let's wedge an air pirate in the middle. Guard armor is the first boss, which makes sense, but then why the fuck is it Hades next? Why is the card soldier stuck between Riku Replica and Ansem? Anyway, Hades gives the Berserk ability for 40 CP and has the same effect as it does in other games, boosting attack power when your HP is low. It also has the added benefit slash drawback of giving you resistance to fire, but stunning you if hit by blizzard moves. This is a fine trump card, but I'd always rather just pack some cure spells instead of risking going in to deal damage with low HP. Next, we've got the Trick Master, fought at the end of Wonderland. This one gives you the Value Break ability for 25 CP, and its low cost should hint that it's not very good. It necessitates that your own card be broken for it to come into effect. Essentially, if your card is broken, the enemy's card that breaks it will drop by one point in value. So if an enemy breaks my 2 card with a 3, their card will drop to a 2, and then I can break it with my own 3. This will last for the next 10 of your cards that are broken after activation. When taking all of your other options into account, even if you only have this, Guard Armor, and Card Soldier by the end of Wonderland, I'd recommend using those other two over this. Here we have the Genie Jafar card, or the Jafar-Genie card as this game calls it, which just feels wrong. And I can't believe this, but after trashing every iteration of this boss, he just might have one of the best cards in the game, especially for how early you can get it. You can go to Agrabah first after Traverse Town and get this card for the Attack Bracer ability, which keeps enemies and bosses alike from breaking your attacks for 20 cards. This means you can go into a fight, pop this card, and throw out a bunch of 1s and 2s, and your enemies can't do shit about it so long as your cards are coming out first. Even if they use zeros or slights adding up to 27, your attacks go unbroken. It costs 65 CP, but I think it's well worth it to let you power through at least the early phase of most encounters, especially in the early game. Doubly so in Riku's story when you're stuck with a bunch of shitty cards in Wonderland. Moving over to Ursula, who's in the second batch of world cards as the boss of Atlantica, even though we haven't finished the first batch yet, Ursula grants the Shell ability, which is like the Defender's Protect effect, but for magic attacks. Instead of lasting a whole reload though, it only lasts for the first 5 hits you take, though it does go so far as to have the damage you take. Still, physical attacks are more common from mobs, so it's probably the less useful of the two. Although you might get some utility out of it during the fights with Axel, Larkseen, and Vexen, since they do have a lot of elemental attacks. 
Next is Oogie Boogie, who for some reason was assigned the regen ability. Maybe it's because he gets brought back to life in Cage 2, which is essentially what this effect does incrementally. Wait, I'm literally realizing as I'm recording the script that he has the healing machine in the Cage 1 fight, so I'm guessing that's what it is. It only costs 40 CP and will heal you a total of 10 times while it's active. I use this card a lot, especially in Riku's story when your healing options are extremely limited. In Sora's story, you can get it as early as the second floor, since Halloween Town is in the first batch of world cards. I should also note that the rate your HP is restored is hastened the lower it is, so it can really get you out of a jam if you're in critical health and don't have any cure cards available. The card also won't be redundant in healing you, so you can use it at the very start of a fight and it'll kick in as soon as you take damage, though I'd advise maybe waiting until you've taken a few hits, since the amount it heals when you're almost full is pretty meager. Up next is Captain Hook, fought at the end of Neverland, with a card that grants you the coveted second chance. For 35 CP, it does the same thing it does in other titles, allowing you to retain 1 HP after a hit that would have normally killed you, so long as you have more than 2 HP when you take that hit. Unlike the ability in the main games, however, you do have to use it actively instead of passively, but it's good to have as a panic button if you find yourself close to death. You also get 3 uses out of it, so if you can heal yourself at least once after each near death, you can milk this card for quite a while. The card also has the added effect of granting you resistance to thunder, but making you stunned when hit by fire, which is a really cool reference to the Hook fight in Cage 1, where Hook would shake off thunder spells and go into a frenzy when hit by fire. Next is the Parasite Cage card, obtained at the Key of Guidance room in Monstro. The cage activates Dispel, which nullifies an opponent's own enemy card so long as one is in play. Which reminds me, you may have noticed that bosses have their own enemy cards, whether it's narcissistic depictions of themselves or regular grunt cards. Like, Captain Hook has the Sea Neon card for some reason. I was always sort of unclear on how and when to use this card, but long story short, you don't need to, like, time it perfectly for when the boss plays their enemy card, like a card break. You can just let them use it, and when you see the little effect and limit next to their deck in the bottom right, then you can play Parasite Cage to cancel it out. It costs 60 CP to equip, though I never really ran into too many occasions where the boss's enemy card was really giving me trouble. I do know Vexen has the Auto Life card, which can definitely be annoying, though I never had him use it myself until getting footage for this. But he also carries Blue Rhapsody and Air Pirate cards, both of which he might even use before his own card, and you can only use the Parasite Cage card once per battle. So, I don't know, that's probably the most practical use for this, it's very situational. Here we've got one of the best cards for Riku's story, Dragon Maleficent. As Sora, you won't get this until floor 7 at the earliest, but Riku's first floor is Hollow Bastion, so he'll have this within the first hour. For 70 CP, the card gives the Overdrive effect, which powers up your attack cards for 30 attacks in exchange for slower reload speed. It's a pretty generous trade-off, and if you're playing as Sora, you'll probably only have to suffer through one, maybe two slower reloads to get through 30 beefed-up attacks. But this is, like, the perfect card for Riku. There's basically no reason to not use it nearly constantly. It costs nothing to equip since it's in the deck by default, you get it in the first world, and it has no effect on your reload speed since Riku always reloads instantly anyway. So it's just 30 free strong attacks per battle. It maintains utility throughout the whole campaign, since Riku has no crazy slates to clear mobs until he triggers dark mode, so you can even continue using this after the final battle if you want to grind Riku to level 99 for the trophy. Sort of similar to the Parasite Cage card is the Dark Side card, which grants Mimic, allowing you to copy a boss's enemy card instead of just outright nullifying it. The cost is a whopping 99 CP, and the Dark Side card is in a 6-way tie for most expensive card in the game. Like Parasite Cage, you just need to wait until the boss activates their own card and then play Dark Side to copy it. Unfortunately, by the time you beat Destiny Islands, which is when you get this card, there's only a handful of bosses left, which really limits its utility, especially since there's no real post-game to speak of. You'll be able to use it on Repliku 4, Larkseen, Axel, and Marluxia, but that's it. Of that group, you'll probably get the most mileage out of it on Marluxia and Axel, which we'll talk about later. But it's hard to justify given its high price, on top of the fact that you'll hopefully have a ton of other cards and strategies that can take care of those guys more efficiently. Next is the Riku Replica card, which was just called Riku in Original Com and PS2 Recom, so I guess it kind of spoils it here when you pick it up after the last Repliku battle. This one's pretty good, but also a bit pricey. For 80 CP, it gives you the Slight Lock ability, which lets you reuse cards used in Slights even after reloading. This applies to the first 5 Slights used after activation, so if you want to use 5 Lethal Frames or Xantetsukins, you can do that, and then still have the same cards to do it again on the next reload, where you'd normally lose the first card from each Slight. In addition, you get resistances to Blizzard, Fire, and Thunder, the latter two potentially coming in handy for the upcoming Axel and Lark scene fights. Even though Riku does fight the replica, he doesn't get his own replica card, I guess because that'd be confusing to keep in your wallet next to your driver's license. Hopping back to Wonderland, regrettably, for the card Soldier card, because sure, this is where that belongs. 
Halfway through Wonderland, you get the Card of a Card, which grants attack haste. For 55 CP, the first 30 attacks you use after activating it are considerably sped up. This is another pretty good one for how early you can get it, and without having to farm enemies at the mercy of RNG. I like to use this one from time to time, since you can really just bully enemies with it and speed up early grinding if need be. Riku also unfortunately misses out on this card, since he never fights the card soldiers on his Wonderland trip. Another card that Riku somehow misses but Sora gets is the Ansem card, despite Sora never fighting him in this game. This is another card that had a different ability in original com called Slight Blind, which is sort of like the Dark Ball card, but hides the cards being stocked for slights. This is, as expected, useless in Recom, so this part of the ability is removed, and the only benefit it has for Sora is granting resistance to Fire, Blizzard, and Thunder moves. This costs 40 CP and lasts for 10 slights, which is not directly tied to the buff you get from it, so you can just keep the elemental resistances for quite a while. As for acquiring it, from this point on, the rest of the cards are going to be found in Bounty or Key to Rewards rooms after fulfilling certain requirements. In Ansem's case, you need to beat Marluxia as well as clear Riku's story before this card shows up in the next Twilight Town Bounty room you create after meeting those requirements. Note that this is different from Original Calm, where Ansem was a Castle Oblivion bounty. So, given that you need to literally beat both campaigns to unlock this card, it has very limited use. The first of the organization cards is Xemnas, whose card isn't obtained as part of the story since he never appears in this game. All of the KH2 organization members are added as key to rewards treasures accessible if you've watched Days on the Remix or if you've cleared both campaigns if playing on the English PS2 version. That being said, there's way more room for these cards having more utility in the Remix version given that you're able to actually get them before beating every boss in the game. Still though, it depends on how early they're accessible. In Xemnas' case, he shows up in Wonderland's Key to Rewards. Unfortunately, Key to Rewards cards won't drop until the 7th floor, meaning that's the earliest you can get any of the organization cards that appear in the first set of worlds. Key to Rewards drops randomly, but I typically just go to whatever world I have as floor 7 and grind for them in the unknown room at the start. Bear in mind that you can only hold one rewards card at a time, so make sure to use it as soon as you get it so you can pick up another. Also, since Riku doesn't get key to rewards, he unfortunately won't have access to any of these organization cards beyond two that he gets in his story. Anyway, Xemnas' ability is Quick Barrier, possibly referencing his use of barriers and shields during his boss battles. For 65 CP, this card will guard against attacks that hit you multiple times. You'll take the first hit, but any consecutive follow-ups will get guarded. It lasts for 3 reloads, and I could definitely see it having some use during boss battles to help avoid those annoying stunlock moves. The card also grants you resistance to fire, blizzard, thunder, and special type attacks, which are basically any attacks that aren't physical and also aren't those three elements. For the sake of brevity, most of these organization cards have these same resistances, so I won't bother noting them unless there is a deviation. Next up is Zigbar, who fittingly comes with the Shot Charge ability, referencing his use of his arrow guns. This costs 80 CP to equip, and for two reloads it powers up what the game calls Missile Attacks. Essentially, this means any attack that shoots out horizontally from Sora's Keyblade. So, Fire, Blizzard, Homing Blizzara, Strike Raid, Fire Raid, Blizzard Raid, Thunder Raid, Judgment, Reflect Raid, and Aqua Splash. Naturally, if you find yourself using a lot of these missile moves, this isn't a bad option. I just, uh, I was like doubting myself on saying missile, and I like googled it, and apparently it's missile for the US and missile for the UK. Maybe I should have gotten Novayan to read this part. Anyway, you can get Zigbar's card in the Hollow Bastion Key to Rewards room, so again, floor 7 at the earliest and 10 at the latest. Next is Zaldin with an enemy card ability that's way more interesting than he is. For 65 CP, you can equip his card for Arrow Guard, which surrounds Sora in the classic KH1 type of arrow shield. This will protect you for 3 attacks before dissipating, and like Aroga, it'll actually damage enemies on contact. I realized during this project that you can bully a handful of bosses using this. Stickman Sham did a video on it where Sora just solos Vexen using the Zaldan card, which I'll link in the description. Seems like humanoid bosses who aren't in the typical circular arena are the easiest to cheese with this. Zaldan's card is in Monstro's Key to Rewards room, so you'll need to get a rewards card at floor 7 or above, and then circle back to get it. The first of the organization cards that you actually get through fighting them is Vexen's, which comes with the Auto Life ability for 60 CP. As Sora, you get this after the second battle with him in Twilight Town, and as Riku, you don't get it because fuck you, I guess. This card is functionally the same as Tinkerbell's revival effect from her KH1 summon, because these two are just peas in a pod. 
Like Oogie Boogie or Captain Hook, you can't go wrong with carrying this card for emergencies since it's pretty much a get out of death free card. Well, I, I mean, it's not free because it costs 60 card points, so I guess the metaphor there is, is kind of muddied. If you're not using any other enemy cards, you can just use this one at the start of every fight for insurance since it only runs out if it actually needs to revive you. It could especially come in handy during some of these late game boss fights. A note on the elemental resistances, instead of the usual, the Vexen card makes you entirely immune to blizzard attacks but stuns you when hit by fire attacks. Next is Lexius, which Riku actually gets before Sora can by defeating him at Basement Floor 4. Sora can get it after both stories have been cleared in a Castle Oblivion bounty chest. Note that this isn't a key to rewards, just a normal blue map card with a chest in it. The Lexius ability is Warp Break, which has a chance of obliterating enemies with the last hit of your combo for 50 attacks after activation. That seems like a lot of attacks, but bear in mind that since it needs to be a combo finisher, it's really more like 16-ish attacks. When successful, instead of the usual death animation, enemies will warp away, still dropping experience points. I don't know the actual data on it, but it seems like it's likelier the lower your enemy's HP is. As Sora, it costs 99 CP to equip, and obviously for Riku, it's free. Since Sora can only use this post-game, there's limited utility here, even though it doesn't work on bosses anyway. I guess it's not your worst option when trying to grind up to 99 for the trophy, but there are better slates and cards to use for that, which are probably more consistent, if you ask me. In addition, the Lexius card also grants immunity to ice and resistance to physical attacks, but increased vulnerability to special attacks. Another card from Riku's story is the Zexion card, obtained after the Recom exclusive battle with him on Destiny Islands. Just like with Lexius, Sora can get this card after both campaigns, this time in a Destiny Islands bounty. The Zexion card grants Confuse Strike, which is inarguably worse and less practical than the Lexius card. For 50 attacks, it has a chance of confusing enemies, but by the time either character can use this, there's just so many other options to deal with mob fights, and it's especially not worthwhile for Sora at a whopping 65 CP. A card with a bit more potential is Psyx's, obtained in Traverse Town's Key to Rewards room. His ability is called Combo Boost, I'm assuming because they already used Berserk on Hades. For a cost of 80 CP and lasting for 20 attacks, Combo Boost makes your attack cards get increasingly stronger with consecutive attacks and only returns to normal when either your card is broken or the Psyx card wears off. Considering you can at least get this one for the second batch of worlds, it's not a bad choice, especially if you've got a lot of high value attack cards in your deck. Next up is the Axel card, which you get after the second fight with him at the Key to Beginnings room in Castle Oblivion. For 75 CP, this card gives you the Quick Recovery ability, which lets you use cards even while staggering from damage. This can definitely have its uses, it's just a shame that you get it so late in the game. Axel himself has moves that hit you multiple times, so you can actually use the Dark Side card on him during his own battle to mimic Quick Recovery before you actually get it. The effect will last for the first 10 hits you take after playing the card. In addition, while the card is in play, Sora is immune to fire but stunned by ice moves. Up next we have Demix, whose card grants the Water Charge effect. Since water isn't its own elemental type in Recom, the effect boosts up the power of any ice-based attacks and lasts for two reloads. This costs 80 CP and is applicable to any tier of Blizzard Spell, Homing Blizzara, Blizzard Raid, Aqua Splash, and Freeze. You can get the card in Atlantica's Key to Rewards room, so if you have a mob clearing deck built around Blizzard, this can definitely have utility for the second half of the game. It does cost more than the Blue Rhapsody card, but you get two reloads out of it, and I'm pretty sure your damage output is boosted more by the Demix card. In addition, you're immune to ice and resistant to thunder and special attacks. Next is the card for a man who is noticeably missing from the game centered around card-based combat, Luxord. Not Luxord, I don't know him. The Luxord card grants the Omni Break ability, which is like the zero of enemy cards. For 99 CP, you have 15 uses of this applied to your cards, which function as zeros regardless of their value. This means you can break nines with ones if you want to. Bear in mind though that just because you break a card, that doesn't mean another enemy can't come in and break it with something higher. If you break a 2 with a 1, an enemy can just break your 1 with a 2. So in a mob fight, it's pretty rough, but you could definitely employ that all zero strategy from the pirate card to break 15 of a boss's slights if you want. You get the Luxord card from Agrabah's Key to Rewards, so you could at least have it for the second half of the game. And the last card that Sora can get from fighting a boss is the Marluxia card after the first battle with him on the 13th floor. Also costing 99 CP, the card bestows the Double Slate ability, which lets you use a slate or trio of stocked cards twice in a row, spending the cards only one time. Again, you unfortunately get this very late, but you can still get some use out of it during the third Marluxia fight and the post-game grind if you're hunting trophies. If you want, you can use this card early on in a battle and turn three of your favorite mob clearing slates into six of them, if only to have the amount of times you mash the triangle button. Interestingly, while the Marluxia card grants you the usual elemental resistances, it also makes you weaker against physical attacks. 
Next is Marluxia's co-conspirator, Larxene, whose card you get after defeating her in the hall between Destiny Islands and Castle Oblivion. For how tough she can be, her ability is unfortunately pretty underwhelming, especially for its cost and how late in the game you get it. Her ability is Dash, which costs 65 CP to equip, and it just makes Sora run faster. And I mean, it works, but you're not going to get a ton of mileage out of it. To be honest, I'd rather have this ability in the field instead of in battle. It also only lasts for 15 cards, which isn't even going to be a full deck by this point in the game. As you probably expected, it does grant you immunity to thunder attacks, but also saddles you with a vulnerability to special attacks. And the last of the organization cards, and arguably the best, is Roxas, with the double strike effect, referencing his ability to dual wield Oathkeeper and Oblivion. The ability doubles the damage dealt by attack cards for 20 attacks, and you get it from the Twilight Town Key to Rewards room. Even though it costs 99 CP and you get it later than all of the non-story organization cards, I'd still say it's worth using. You can really just shred HP with this, especially when using Keyblade cards with a higher attack rate, and you've still got a handful of the toughest bosses left if you get this card as soon as it's available. And in the post-game level grind, if you're using slights like Mega Flares or summons like Dumbo to clear mobs in Castle Oblivion quickly, you're bound to have elemental enemies like Wizards or the Prismatic Melodies left over, or even Neo Shadows that hit in the floor, so you can throw on the Roxas card to make quick work of the Stragglers. One of the best enemy cards in the game, for my money. And these last two cards aren't technically enemy cards, but they're still sorted into the same category, so we'll cover those two. The first is the gold card, only available for Sora after you get literally every other card in the game, after which you can find this in the first bounty room you open. So, yeah, definitely very limited utility here. The card grants the premium guard ability for 5 reloads at the cost of 99 CP, and this ability just makes it so you can reload premium cards. I never use them a ton myself, but if you're unaware, premiums have a lower CP cost, but can only be used once and can't normally be reloaded. So you can strategize around that a bit by making them the first card in a slate, since you'd lose that card anyway, but that's really the extent of it. Again, you're not only done with the campaign, but likely a chunk of the post-game grind at this point, so it's not really very useful for the same batch of mobs you'll be fighting in Castle Oblivion. But if you really wanted to, you can basically make your entire deck premium cards, since it's incredibly unlikely you'll run out of cards within 5 reloads. And finally, we have the Platinum card, also only available after collecting every other card and found in the second bounty chest you open after the Gold card. This one grants the Invincible effect for 99 CP and lasts for 20 attacks. As you'd expect, it makes Sora entirely immune to any type of attack. As cool as it sounds, there is, again, only so much use you can get out of it during the post-game grind. Any time you might spend being invincible is better spent popping a different enemy card to help you kill mobs as fast as possible to get to 99. There's no bosses or challenges to conquer at this point, so this thing is little more than a shiny novelty. But I suppose it's better than nothing as a reward for your hard work. And there you have it, that's every enemy card in the game. A few takeaways from this. As much as I enjoy Calm, and in spite of coming around on its battle system, I feel like the huge disparity between the practicality of these cards highlights a real balance issue with the game, which is already pretty easily broken by easy-to-make powerful slates in the second half. There are just card combinations that are so clearly more optimal than others that it often feels like you're wasting your time to bother with other strategies. The game just isn't quite deep or long enough to fully justify all these different battle modifiers. That being said, if you're not concerned with doing things quickly and just want to see everything the game has to offer, there are certainly valid and worthwhile strategies that you can cook up with these cards and new deck combinations might give the game a bit more replay value. That brings me to my most major point though, which is the lack of a substantial post-game, or more ideally, a new game plus. It's such a shame that you can't use your clear data to start up a new game on some sort of critical difficulty that lets you keep all the enemy cards you've accrued. It could have paved the way for so many more practical applications of late-game enemy cards that otherwise probably just collect dust in your journal. Even just a slightly more fleshed-out post-game that allowed you to refight bosses with higher cards and more HP for a chance at earning levels or other cards could have given you the opportunity to use these enemy cards more often. Even if it was just to earn trophies or achievements, you'd at least have something to do and more chances to take advantage of some really cool and creative abilities tucked away in these cards. It's unfortunate, since I don't see Recom ever existing in a more complete state than its Remix release, so unless the Land of Departure regresses back into Castle Oblivion someday, I think the finer aspects of the card system will sadly never reach their fullest potential. But not to end on a downer note though, because I still had fun researching and learning more about the game for this project, and I hope you found it at least a little interesting. It was definitely more of a clinical video than the other compendiums, but I wanted to give Chain of Memories some more time in the spotlight after really enjoying my time playing through it again on Twitch. And here's the part where the jingle plays again.
Hi. <laughs> yes, so if you hadn't seen from my Twitter or my YouTube post or my Twitch, I have shaved the beard for 2022. Um, don't worry, it's at a farm upstate. It's going to be fine. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like. And if you're not subscribed, why not do it? Please? Um, at the time of recording, we are only about like four or five patrons away from reaching the 100 patron stretch goal. Fingers crossed that people don't drop off just to fuck with me. But upon reaching that goal, I have committed to watching every single direct-to-DVD Disney movie and ranking or tier listing them or, or something. I'll be intoxicated, that's about as much as I've figured out so far. So if you are so inclined to see that video or just help me out in general, um, please consider heading on over to patreon.com slash regularpat. That is the best way to support me as I make these videos and do this as my full-time gig. I really appreciate the year of 2021 that was basically gifted to me from all of you on a silver platter and so far 2022 has been no different thank you so much there's more in store stay tuned and i will see you next time